Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Acts 9, beginning in verse 1 through verse 22. The word of the Lord. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he, if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Now the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. And Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him away by the hand into Damascus. And for three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. And the Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. And in a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man... He's my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, the Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And he got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. And at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Thanks be to God for his word. The particular verse that pulls it all together for me is verse 15. Let me read that again. Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Saul, as he was called at the time, well, he was making a name for himself. And he was gathering quite a reputation in his own religious circles at that time. There was this extensive campaign going out against this emerging Christian community which was having some success. And Saul was the leader of this attack on the Christian community. In fact, he was successful enough that many Christians just scattered throughout the area, afraid for their future. 
there were just a few stubborn, dedicated followers left. A remnant of people managing somehow to keep it together. People were pulled out of their homes, incarcerated, and even there was loss of life. And the center of it all, the leader of it all, the edge of it all was no less than the instigator and leader, Saul. In fact, he was rather obsessed with the whole cause. Now, some have wondered if there was this intense internal struggle already going on emotionally in Paul's life, and that that was behind his fanaticism and his extremism, indicating that maybe he was fighting his own doubts that were emerging, and that sometimes happened. You do it more to convince yourself than someone else. We don't know what was going on in Paul's life, or Saul's life as he was called at that time, but there's no question whatever that the very breaking point came quickly and without question. The career of his hatred against the Christian follower came to an extremely abrupt end on that road to Damascus. And there was no doubt at all that it was the Lord himself who stopped him in his tracks. He could go no further, blinded from the light of heaven. You'll notice that Luke is sure to tell us who wrote the, this book of Acts it wasn't by some human intervention or perpetrator that stopped Paul that day. God himself intervened. And that is the important point of what happens here. The Lord himself is the one who's responsible for this turnabout in Saul's life, changing him into a church father by the name of Paul. And the very intensity of it bears that out. First, he's the leader who tries to put an end to the Christian movement. He's going in one direction. Then suddenly everything is turned on his head and the persecutor becomes the one who's persecuted. And the enemy of the follower of Christ becomes the very defender. His former friends are now the opposition. And the one who many feared was now their spokesman and their friend. Only God himself could accomplish anything that major, that drastic, that defining moment. In fact, our text reads, this man is my chosen instrument. Persecutor Saul's conversion to Apostle Paul is definitely Without question, God's work. Everything gets turned around. He couldn't fight God off any longer. Now, there's a real temptation to make Paul's transformation a model for all believers. I mean, it's even called a Pauline conversion. And new Christians sometimes are known to show how the change in their life was an imitation of what happened to Paul. Now, there are, of course, similarities in many basic ways. At their root, they are very much the same. It's a transformation from death to life. It's a transformation from darkness to light. It's a transformation of being alienated from God to being a beloved child of God. And yet, I think... We're not told about Paul's conversion for the purpose of showing exactly, necessarily, how it has to happen with each one of us. It can, but that's not really the point. But Luke does tell us about the conversion to show that you and I already have our beginning as followers of Christ. We got started there already as a movement of God. And frankly, we're here today because of God's intervening life in Paul's life that's already began in us. It's not so much that our conversions and transformations are really imitations of Paul's. 
They are the result, the result. They grow out of the miracle of new life that through him continues to happen again today. We know it in his powerful letters to the churches and his missionary journeys resulting in many new conversions. And my own transformation, I have to attribute it in many ways to the miracle of the Apostle Paul. When I read the letters that he wrote from prison, inspiring me, transforming me, invigorating me, empowering me, and I trust you as well. Folks, we're talking about our own spiritual roots here in the Church Father Paul. We're celebrating our transformations. And because of Paul's conversion, you and I are not the same because of it. God working in Paul's life is God working in the world, working in you, working in me, through a legacy of transformations after that, through his ministry and through his growing family. But it was all for a very specific purpose. And that's the second point. You see, Paul was transformed for a very definite, defined purpose. It's not simply that he needed a change in his life, although he did. It doesn't mean that he was converted so he could live happily ever after. To the contrary. We read, I must show him how much he must suffer for my name. In fact, the undercurrent of his life was about suffering. And nor was Paul certainly in the business of trying to make a name for himself. He is to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and before the people of Israel. You know, today, we tend to believe that we are transformed uh, mostly for personal benefit and advantage. But you'll notice, though, that there's nothing about Paul having a nice life after he was changed, is there? He spent a lot of his ministry in prison, writing letters to churches from there. Now, that's not to deny that Paul experienced many rich blessings in his life. He certainly did. But the purpose of his transformation was to lead to ours as God continues to move through him and his legacy to us. And in that very purpose, we take part in our challenging and yet opportune time as his instruments of transformation today. And as far as I'm concerned, the moment for involvement in that purpose couldn't be more fitting. You see, as I see it, all the attempts to fix life and the world are frankly just running out of steam. And life is out of control. Even a little virus can't, we can't control. It's a mystery. And all the spirits of the age, well, they've run their course. Our civilization is in a crisis with no consensus on really how to move forward with any great success about what life is about and what needs to happen. It sounds pessimistic, but it's also a marvelous opportunity to carry this name of the Lord as the way and the truth and the life and the miracle of new life as that continues to happen in and through us. A favorite writer of mine, Richard Mao, in his book, Distorted Truth, relates the account of an anthropologist who tells the story of a Russian factory worker who regularly pushed a wheelbarrow home from work. At the checkpoint, they would always make sure that everything was fine and there was nothing he was taking out of the factory that the wheelbarrow was empty. And after a while, they didn't even really check anymore because, oh, it's him. He's 
coming through with his empty wheelbarrow. So they let him go with a quick glance and a nod of his head. It was only after several months they discovered he'd been walking out with all kinds of wheelbarrows. And I kind of like that analogy because it points to where we're kind of at today. We're certainly very preoccupied with the contents of the wheelbarrow, with the contents of life, the details, the amenities, the job security, the renovations, the vacation travel, and just trying to keep busy in difficult times. And we don't focus so much on what's carrying all these contents or where we're going with it. It seems to not be a big part of the picture. Fathers are usually very good at looking after the important details of life. That's why they're like tools. The contents of the wheelbarrow, if you will. And in my neighborhood, I hear the sounds of a lot of property renovations lately and maintenance going on. Power hammers, saws, hedge clippers, grass trimmers, lawn mowers, and all that good stuff. And fathers are very good at that. And they're also very good at instilling in their children the value of a good education so that they'll have secure, successful future employment and be able to participate somehow in a, a level of the Canadian dream and standard of life, a secure life. They want to teach them the ropes. And their children pick up on it. They see dad with what he's busy with and what's important to him and what he spends his time on and what he focuses on. They pick up on it and they learn from it. Now imagine, imagine what could happen if fathers in their life activities also showed by their choices, their words, and their actions what's carrying all these contents of life and where they're going with it. Is it just another reflection of the Canadian dream which frankly is becoming more and more out of reach and elusive for the next generation of children? Or is it something that reflects where their lives need to be and to go? When the Apostle Paul was transformed to be a follower of Jesus, it certainly drastically changed what was carrying his life and where it was going, it even changed the contents of the wheelbarrow in a major way. From now on, his ministry was to both Jew and Gentile because that was where life needed to go and that's where the future of the kingdom of God was all about. And so that's what he had to be all about. And as a result of that intervening miracle of Paul's life. He was the one who later in Ephesians, for example, announces this abolition of the wall between the Jew and the Gentile, between two very basic ethnic groups at that time. The two become one in Jesus Christ. And all the details of his life were now carried with that mission in his mind and heart and became the goal for the rest of his life. And it's, it's Paul's miraculous transformation now that inspires and equips us also in this transformation where God is going with his kingdom. That's not now what we are about. Along with the many results, of course, when you read Paul's letters, this is for sure. Life matters, whatever background. It transforms the way that we relate to the colored community, to the indigenous community, to the refugee far afield or the one who's still trying to make it in this country. And that's going to take more than just new policies and new regulations and protocols and procedures. It's going to take 
a miracle. A change in attitude, a change in heart that shapes how we do things, where we go with it. It will change, in fact, the very contents of the wheelbarrow of life. Perhaps reducing the contents or realigning them and replacing them so that we go where we need to go. And the miracle of the transformation of Paul's life then continues on today. His legacy of miracles in which we participate as he changes the spirit of God, our hearts, and moves us forward as God intervenes to transform us to his purpose today. It lives on. It lives on to prepare the next generation where life needs to go. And he'll get us there. The only question is whether we're going to be part of it. Notice what happened as a result of Paul's conversion and carrying the name of the Lord in his life. Then the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in number, living in the fear of the Lord. That's what happens when the spirit of transformation, the spirit of Jesus Christ, intervenes and moves us where we need to go for him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we give thanks for the miracle of new life and for the miracle of our church fathers, we think especially of the Apostle Paul, who you turned around and changed to change the world. And his spirit, your spirit, continues to do that in us as you transform our hearts and renew us where we need to be renewed and become part of that grand work of yours in the world when all things come together in Jesus Christ our Lord. Show us and teach us how to get on board with that. In Christ we pray. Amen.